If Pop Smoke was still alive, y'all would be calling him irrelevant by now. <laughs> you can't get mad at the state of hip hop when it's you same horn dogs putting Ice Spice on stage. Ah! It should have been me, not him! I remember reading this saying, which at the time I didn't completely understand, but through both study and observing the world around me, it began to make a lot more sense. The strongest adversary of freedom isn't that which threatens freedom itself, but from its failure to guide, lead and understand its own power. The same way fire can give life, it can also take it away. The same way the pursuit of liberty can bring forth change and choice, the mishandling and conceit of liberty can lead it right back to the cage it fought so tirelessly to break free from. I didn't quite understand it back then, but after I made that up, things started to make a lot more sense. Music is universal. No matter what language you speak, where you're from, who you are, or what you do, music is one of the strongest forces known to man that can truly bring about change, inspiration, and influence. It goes without saying that this is one of the strongest weapons against, well, anything. So it makes sense as to why so many record labels and companies try to utilize it for leverage. Super Bowl, video game and movie trailers, commercials. I would honestly argue that it really has become an essential quality to our experience in being alive. The thing about music is that while it is eternal, it is not immune to phases or trends. Genres will be replaced if they fail to adapt to the times. And when I say to the times, I really mean to the money. So when I say we sold out hip hop, I really do mean we sold out hip hop. This has become a barren wasteland of literal ass. Even when you have someone like Big Sean, despite Kendrick Lamar being seen as the linchpin of conscious rap, it's becoming overplayed, very redundant, excessively stupid, uninspiring, and very exploitative. There was a time, and when I say a time, I really do mean like a couple years ago, when I wanted all those old heads to stay quiet and just let rap be rap. But the more I listened to it, the more I was beginning to see that this is just not what it used to be anymore. Now, I will say this. If things cannot change, they will never evolve. Every few years, hip hop goes through an evolutionary change in the mainstream, from its boom bap style in the 80s to that melodic jazz step to raw rap style in the 90s, to the incorporation of more alternative sounds in the 2000s with more club beats and mainstream commercial hits, to the mid 2010s where it was mainly pushing commercial hits and mainstream hits, to where now in the 2020s, I don't know what the fuck this shit is. Anyone can be a rapper nowadays. And that's a bad thing as much as it is supposed to be a good thing. While I'm not entirely for gatekeeping, it isn't the fact that there are now no gatekeepers, but the gates have just been removed entirely. You can't have infiltrators if the identity of this medium has lost itself. But let me not be too harsh and or critical, as it isn't entirely the artist's fault. While they share a level of accountability, you can't definitively pinpoint one set thing or person to be the reason as to why this art form we love so dearly has now become a shell of its former self. It'd be easy to say, oh blame capitalism, but capitalism isn't the sole issue in this discussion, nor would that be a fitting description for a complex problem. I mean, uh, but then again, the consumers, the media, the artists, social media, expansion, globalization, money, pick any one of these things and a study could be dedicated to hip hop selling out. Truth of the matter is, everyone has a part to play in why this once beautiful concept has turned into a septic tank of fossilized donkey shit seasoned with battle rappers albums. Because why, in what galaxy, did we decide to give all these niggas a pass? And upon acknowledging that, I'm beginning to form the opinion that hip hop was designed to fall from its respect and grace from the very beginning. As always, the subject's history gives us both greater understanding of the subject's nature and development. Hip hop first made waves in 1970s New York from house and block parties where people would walk around with boom boxes and you start freestyling. There were no records, CDs, or vinyls to run them back on, you literally had to be there. As this newfound art form and culture would begin to proliferate, they would be put on cassette tapes and would later find their way onto the radio. Initially, it was groups like Sugar Hill Gang, Grandmaster Flash, and Furious Five talking about some hippity hoppity hippity hoop, clean radio play for very simple external rhymes. It wasn't until it got to the mid to late 80s when artists like Eric B and Rakim, LL Cool J, Run DMC, Ice T and NWA brought forth a new type of sound to hip hop. With the former establishing a new east coast boom bap sound and complex rhyme schemes and the latter really platforming the west coast sound with a gritty gangster rap. 
The transition into the 90s with Cube going solo and the emergence of Wu-Tang Clan were elements that gave hip-hop that stamp which garnered a much more public attention, in media and politics. Due to it being extremely young, it was less about commercializing your records and more about rapping with a purpose and passion, a message. Letting people know who you are. Rapping with the ability to craft an intricate narrative within a set amount of bars, all while creating an idiosyncratic identity for the MC. Within this era, you had Nas, Jay-Z, Biggie, Tupac, Big L, AZ, LOX, Snoop Dogg, Corrupt, KRS-One, and so many more that really spoke for the streets and the reality of the black community. You had diss tracks, people selling crack, shooting up studios, shooting up each other. It really was a beautiful and community building era for hip hop. And I don't even say that sardonically because it was those very components that built the structure that a lot of people either begrudgingly or with honor accolade. You see, that was one of the powerful appeals to hip hop. It all felt real. When you listen to Illmatic for the first time, it wasn't like you're just hearing songs, but it was as if Nas gave you the headphones and you could hear the heartbeat of New York in a beautiful melodic manner. When Reasonable Doubt dropped, JD credited this manifesto to a hustler's success. They gave the streets a voice, and for a time, no matter how gritty or dark, it was beautiful and real. And then Eminem happened. And with Eminem being the first reputable white rapper, the conversation of who could and couldn't be allowed into hip hop slowly began to form. From race, demographics, and regions, especially with heavy East Coast versus West Coast conflict, any outsiders were quickly dismissed. Irrelevant of his MC skills, at the end of the day, you're white. Shut up. Ironically, this is a time where being white really did not serve a white man's benefit because, as far as the record labels go, they knew the appeal and money that came from African Americans and African American culture. It was easy to exploit the black struggle even if its politics stood against those very corporations. Dr. Dre, being very used to such controversy himself, discarded all of that and gave Eminem the platform and spotlight to exercise his talents. Due to that, Eminem became a major pivotal shift into making hip hop far more mainstream and soon to be commercialized to where it saw its artists just as commodities. But I'll expand on more on that later. Because remember, no matter who you are in the entertainment industry, you can and will be replaced. 2000s were when the identity of hip hop being largely associated with gang violence, political and social economic rhythmic thought pieces, and narratives detailing the abstractions of the American dream began to find itself sharing a space with more club hits and feel good music. I'd like to say 50 Cent and his Get Rich or Die Trying album was one of the most important albums of that generation and transition. The songs like In The Club, 21 Questions, and P.I.M.P, he illustrated how a street artist can make rap songs that can generate national and even international play, all while remaining authentic to who he is. Not saying he was the first one to do so, but he was most definitely one of the most notable. As that progressed, you would see the likes of new faces from different places in America taking stage. Outkast, Nelly, Lupe Fiasco, T.I., Pump It Up Button, Lil Wayne, and a list of others creating subgenres within this medium. Hip hop began to grow larger and larger and started becoming a lot more accessible to a wider range of people. Backpack rap, trap, whatever noises E40 makes, dark rap, these genres started to develop internal fan bases which assisted in diversifying both hip hop and the culture surrounding it. However, while it was becoming a lot more expansive and more known rappers would start to drop that rough rugged lifestyle rap because the subject matter was diversifying, adopting more mature tones and or feel good sounds, I wouldn't say it was necessarily losing its identity, just trying on new clothes. It wasn't until the late 2000s to 2010 set that its unfamiliarity started to look far more palpable. This shit began to suck dog. I'm gonna keep it a buck with you. We never quite noticed it back then, or if we did, we sure were in a lot of denial. But it was gradually getting harder and harder to see hip hop as an expressive art form and more as another business expense for companies to realize their cash flows, marketing assets, and other forms of being able to stream income. I'd honestly argue the early 2010s was the last time we saw a generation of long lasting artists. With Drake, J. Cole, and Kendrick being the big three. Oh, wait, my bad. With Kendrick, Kenny Hendrix, and K. Dot being the big me of that generation, the ceiling was never really broken through in terms of who is better than these three. Merging commercial success whilst maintaining the essence of what hip hop was built on, Kendrick Lamar and J. Cole are a few of, if not, and I'd love it if you guys debated this in the comments. The only two that really fit that mold of being able to acquire huge global success without forfeiting their talent, skills, and identity for the betterment of corporate interests. I mean, Kendrick did perform a censored version of All Right at the Super Bowl, which 
kind of defeated the purpose of that song, especially given how the NFL has Rock Nation lead its live entertainment strategy. And even though Jay-Z spoke out against the NFL about such events, he did pretty much nothing in support of not only Colin Kaepernick, but black radical injustice in general. And he still plays a major part in the orchestration of the halftime shows since signing the deal in 2019. And he probably didn't give a rat's ass about the pro-Israel propaganda that played in the ad this year. But okay, I mean, we'll give Kendrick a pass because he's Kendrick, I guess. But I guess that example should really give you an insight as to how black artists are very quick to abandon the roots of hip hop to play pretend revolutionary. I've been here before. Because hip hop grew far past its struggling upbringing and you didn't have to constrain yourself or necessarily feel like you had to be from the streets or a very broken background for credibility and or status, it allowed a new essence of rappers into the game. Now, this is where one of the main problems manifested in regards to how black people sold out hip hop. You see, hip hop is, well, what currently feels like was a form of expressionism. While its inception was people freestyling and generally enjoying a new type of sound, it served as a voice for the unheard, the projections of the anguished and the protests of the unsettled. The beauty of it is that rappers of the time knew their influence and messages would have far better use as opposed to killing and further perpetrating the image of white America constructed for the African American culture. This was the type of new creative intelligence that no one had really tapped into and to such lengths and degrees. Because of the likes of N.W.A., Pac, Biggie, Nas, G-Unit, Dipset, Big Pun, Big L, and so on and so forth, they had all contributed in sculpting this image of what would be the foundations of hip-hop. It's why when people, typically old heads, say there's no meaning in rap no more, their point of reference are those aforementioned architects because they were not only around Juno's infantry years, but they also grew up with it. They witness it evolve into what it looks like today, which is this. Rappers turned from street profits into their latest agent to sell and market a new Lambo truck, Louis bag, Gucci, whatever the product may be, they are just further promoting, come on, y'all say it with me, black excellence. This isn't to say such capitalistic promotions did not exist prior, but the abundance of it now takes a much grander stage than usual and in greater circulation. Because of this, many rappers will act and perform if and only if there is a hefty bag involved, not because they want to invoke thought or even skill. Especially in knowing that there's no actual money for them in the music they make, but through the merchandising of the music and that artist, concerts, brand deals, and sponsorships, they will involve themselves in such things, not just to get a return on their investment for actually putting out the music, Music, but to get paid their just dues in the first place. I mean, when these contracts are written up to where these artists receive less points than the executives, publishers, distributors, and all other finance and business contractors, but largely for them to take advances, 360 deals, and lose their rights to their masters, these raps will work like slaves to make a profit from their work, which is where another problem is identified. Rappers are idiots. But it's not inherently their fault. Roll the tape, class is in session. The common upbringing of a rapper, or the ones we commonly see, is usually associated with struggle. It's associated with adversity. Fighting against the constricted rules of nature, capitalist society has cursed upon them, and being one out of 1,000 to make it out. Many of them, unfortunately, succumb to the influence of their environment. They drop out of school, they sell drugs, they partake in gang violence, they shoot people. They get out just to condition people to get back into that. But where many people lose track is that their hustler's mentality does not always equate to a hustler's intellect. When all you know is where the bag is and how to get the bag, you also focus on securing the bag, you don't actually look inside the bag. These companies and agents will sell these rappers in bad faith and the image of getting out the hood or wherever they're from and give them a hefty sum of money or pay them in advance for their services. Picture this example. You've spent the past six years dropping mixtape after mixtape, getting little to no recognition at all. You got roaches in the crib and your mom's struggling to pay rent. You can't afford to go to college and have no academic prospects. The streets are all you know. One day, your hard work pays off. People know who you are, they're bumping your music, they love you and who you are. Soon, a record label finds you and they approach you with a deal. We will finance you with the necessities to make your album, do all the marketing, the licensing, the advertisement, legal fees, distribution, merchandising. We will handle the business of your music and all you gotta do is just make the music, do your thing. Matter of fact, you know what? We'll give you a hundred K in advance just to do the record just just sign here wait why did wait hold on wait wait 
What does 360 do me? Nah, 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 just don't worry about that. That's just fine print stuff. Oh, all right, but where does it say I own my masses? Oh, you know, own Shimon. Who owns anything nowadays? Owning stuff is what slave masses do. And you don't want to be like that, do you? Come on, just sign yourself to the devil. What? Look, we can give you a big booty pending baby mama and a pair of Jordan. Oh shit, that's all you have to say? We all know about such predatory practices and how they happen far more often than we may think because they bank on the miseducation and desperation of the artists to know less than the record label. If you come from a place with no money and education and they give you a way out at the expense of your freedom, do you know what the rapper would then think? How much is my freedom worth right now anyway? And it is an unfortunate reality for a lot of aspiring creatives. And this happens to anyone regardless of race. But hip hop is largely dominated by African Americans and they're the modern day trendsetters. And since financial illiteracy is very much real amongst rappers, they only feel the effects of their bad dealings later on down the line. And while a lot of rappers do not fall into this system, there are far more successful creative science labels as opposed to being independent. They bank on the credentials and guarantees sold to them as opposed to their own worth. Then, upon making the artists sell themselves out, they will then enact their consumers to do the same. The thing is, not only do the record labels and other conglomerate companies endorse these artists, they know the consumers will eat all of this up. And since black culture is very influential, no matter what the medium is, these big companies, these big soulless companies I might add, will all think the same thing. If the blacks are doing it, then everyone else will do it. And the best part, if they fuck up, it's only them that fuck up. Hey, that's got nothing to do with us, because all we gotta do is find or make someone else to market our shit and then they'll make us way more rich while smearing their own community. And this is where I think the lifespan of these artists have a very interesting connection. These artists, due to social media and how easily accessible we are to see them nowadays, are more prone to having their chinks in their armor exposed and then to be replaced. As the saying once went, never meet your heroes, the saying should now be unfollow your heroes because they're probably villains that engage in grooming little boys and a whole bunch of ditty worthy shit. So in terms of that lifespan, let's look back at some of the rappers that have emerged to popular success in some way, shape or form from the last, what, six years? Between 2018 and 2024, we have had Polo G, The Baby, Lil Baby, Stunner, NLE Chopper, Blueface, Gunna, Roddy Rich, Fabio Foreign, Youngboy NBA, and YK Osiris, just to name a few. Now, yes, they were selectively chosen, but you can honestly pick anyone from this specific category and the point I'm about to make will still stand. Out of all these rappers right now, I'd say the most commercially relevant one and the one who could drop a record and have a vast majority of people stream it would probably be Lil Baby. And that's because he hasn't dropped a project since 2022. A common practice amongst many of these rappers is that they create consumer fatigue, where they drop too damn much, too damn frequently, and what they drop is too similar in subject matter and sound. Drake is a great example of this. But to those list of rappers, when you lack an actual credible identity from your other contemporaries, lacking enough to where you cannot provide longevity because all y'all sound the damn same and do the damn same things, you either fizzle out, drop excessively, jump on an Aiden Ross stream, or do a 20 versus 1 because you lack independent power to be relevant again. How did you go from having a single with Alicia Keys and Kanye West to ending up on one of these corny ass videos? It just doesn't make sense to me. These people sell out faster than their tours and it's embarrassing, but you want to know something more embarrassing? What is the one thing all those artists have in common? They were all part of their yearly XXL freshman class and when I say the XXL have straight up disgusted their reputation and hip hop as a whole, oh they have done the unforgivable when they put niggas like designer on the freshman class. XXL have made it a trend to put on artists who have done what? one or two viral hits and then put them onto the lineup. And back when that dumbass magazine had any marginal credibility, it was a big deal being a part of that freshman lineup. They had the one hit oneness beforehand, a myriad of other clowns, and those that would soon burst shortly afterwards anyway, but it was nowhere near as consistent as it is today. They bank off the virality and service potential of an artist and not the actual creative merit. See, I've noticed a pattern. These companies, both inside and outside the music industry, do not bank on long-term success for pretty much anyone anymore because they're aware that the current age of entertainment is constantly fleeting. No one wants to sit down to allow a piece of art to digest and a majority of artists themselves know that. So they'll hyperinflate the fuck out of one of their factory workers, I mean, <clears throat> they'll hyperinflate the fuck out of one of their slaves, 
I mean artist, and that artist will OD on autotune and audio mixing to mask their shitty vocals and use harmonies to go ahead and try and mask their trashy lyrics. They'll do this again and again and again and AGAIN until they squeeze them dry until there's nothing left. Unless they got Ice Spice not only represents consumer hypocrisy, but she has got to be one of the worst decisions we have made. First of all, we put her in front of a dying subgenre of rap and drill. That shit is dead in New York, that shit is dead in the UK, and that shit is dead in Chicago, and I really hope it stays dead because all that did was inspire people to pick up the wrong messages, shoot each other, and then make a dance out of it. It's really disgusting how we've actually been conditioned to accept such things so much. Ice Spice shakes what her music is ass y'all seen her at the concerts that betty boop shit was the last straw for me on the kingdom that was top 10 nastiness all y'all pay for that should be ashamed y'all throw your money at damn near a rapping stripper then get the nerve to say i'm being overworked at work shut your dumb ass up you can't say all women do is over sexualize their content and then let your dicks decide who y'all want to see on your feed and on stage and how women will gas this shit up because all the presentation they see is thus this and apparently all presentation is good presentation all y'all are hypocritical fools. You don't like her music, you like watching her, and as a consumer, you have no right to say hip hop is trash yet still condone such actions at the same time. Y'all were saying this when Lil Kim was half naked shaking ass, and y'all saying it now. I wanna state that I don't hate on all this like Ice Spice, I simply just don't care for what she does. It's actually more those in support of her if anything. I mean, this whole song is about shaking ass and she got kids dancing in this shit and a literal crowd of people losing their minds to be there. Why do we find- who is allowing this? The condition that sets in is through the abundant play of this music enforces a more impulsive behavioral habits. If Travis Scott says checks over stripes, you're now going to shame everyone for wearing Adidas. If Future tells you to cheat on your girl just because, then that's what you'll do. If Big Sean Kendrick even said he made you think about it but he's not your savior, but we still look up to these rappers and idolize them as saviors, but we make these voices of these rappers far more powerful than that of certain politicians, activists, and actual revolutionaries. Of course, it'd be very un unreasonable to say black people exclusively sold out hip-hop entirely because America saw it as a new instrument of generating profit and trying to regulate and control a market which they forced African Americans into and then you said people to link the profits back to major conglomerates. In truth, the entire music industry is wicked. However, the accountability draws a large when we, in truth, dictate what we would prefer to see and hear. So sold out is stated in two forms. The first is the obvious problem of profiting from convenience, brand credibility, consumer loyalty and bias, and allowing themselves to be merchandised. In other words, they become the embodiment of the commodities they actively stand against. Cause streams don't pay not a bill unless you're a top hidden artist. With streaming services such as Spotify and Apple Music controlling who they decide to heavily promote, push artificial streams, and through them and the record labels hold much of the revenue and overall profits, artists are compelled to work at the demands of these record labels and brands. They'll make songs specifically geared towards something like TikTok virality because they know that that is a surefire way to maintain relevance, promote their records, and increase their awareness, or jump on a stream because streamers are now the new age marketers, talk show hosts, and entertainers because that is a surefire way to make sure that your brand or product or whatever you're trying to promote can get that level of awareness. Let's keep it a buck, NLE Chocolate just dropped a new song, and then suddenly, he's on the Kaisen that stream. I know they cool, but come on. It's not bad practice, but it, come on. And when you specifically tap into a market and demographic, the metaphor I like to use to describe this current state of hip hop is an array of snapshots and less film. One captures a moment, the other captures a cycle. One focuses on a set frame, the other focuses on multiple frames. One is a chapter, the other is a story. One is fixed, the other is continuous. To illustrate, these are snapshot artists whereas these are film artists. The issue is that there are far more snapshot artists taking these shitty photos. This isn't to say film artists should be intrinsically adulated, but that imbalance is what leads me to the second part of how I feel like we sold out. Hip hop no longer has that respect it was once recognized for and you don't have to be old to see that. When you have double XL lineups composed of nobodies, the biggest artists in the world doing great A corny shit like this dumbass dance, I promise you I hate this dance, please stop doing it, you look like you're having a seizure. It's tough for me to say something. I sound like a hater, but I don't care. Niggas that are struggling to rap on beat, making it big, collaborating with other corn boss to maintain awareness and exposure. 
we seem to forget that hip hop is not just an expression of art, but it is a lifestyle. And this lifestyle has denounced itself from its roots of authenticity in the pursuit of conditional cash grabs, awful business dealings, and fraudulent relationships. Now, we need feel good music. Music that is just as important to alleviate stress and the monotony of seriousness out there. Respectfully, I'm not gonna go down to a function to hear Black Thought. But when it's reached a point where it's in excess, within the music that they glorify, they are a slave to, yet they perpetrate the image that your way of living is less than because you cannot replicate such success. However, the very consumers you laugh at are integral to your success. In knowing this, we've become aware of what everyone is going to say, how they're going to say it, and worst of all, why they're going to say it. It's for these reasons I find value in this Big 3 controversy going on right now, because remember in 2013, Big Sean Kendrick's verse on control seemingly revitalized the competitive spirit in hip hop and, for a brief moment in time, it felt like collectively bars were back. Until it wasn't again. That competition, that battle rap culture and energy faded off into the distance. The gauntlet of the best MCs felt like it had dissipated. 11 years later, I'm beginning to see Kendrick's vexation with being placed in this big three category. How can you have someone like Kendrick, who was the first rapper to ever get a Pulitzer Prize, be placed in the same echelon as J. Cole and Drake, where your body of work isn't about trying to sell the most records or jump on X amount of features anymore, it is constantly placed against your contemporaries, which, personally, you feel like you shouldn't even be in the same league as you. When did rap become this pussyfoot of arena sharing as opposed to trying to get the one prize and be number one? As much as a J. Cole fan I am, I recall slightly at his motivation to push this. See, it's us three. We're the big three. Us three. Us three. Us three. You're right. It is us three. Me, myself, and I. That's what the mentality of hip hop was. That's what it should be. And no rapper really can say that in terms of the philosophy of hip hop and mean that except for Kendrick. I'm gonna be real with you. Drake is the greatest commercial rapper of this generation, but he is far from the greatest rapper in terms of embodying what hip hop was respected upon. J. Cole has become a feature killer and one of the greatest lyricists, but isn't as commercially recognized. Kendrick is the fusion of both where he can rival Drake commercially and has the lyrical ability that can be matched up against J. Cole and even exceed him. And, regardless of generation, the general consensus is that he is the greatest of all time in the last decade and an argument could be made that he is top 10 material. TACTICAL NUKE INCOMING! I also find it funny J. Cole dropped that flaccid ass piss track that was 7 minute drill as I was making this video because by cosmic irony, it proved my idea that the competitive battle culture in hip hop isn't alive anymore. J. Cole sounded scared to fight. He didn't sound like he was ready to shoot anybody. I don't care if it was a warning shot. He picked up a Nerf gun and he was shaking. J. Cole has never actually had to fight anybody throughout the entirety of his career. Do not talk to me about no Diggy Simmons because you didn't even remember that until I said that shit right now. So, when I first recorded this, initially only J. Cole's diss track had dropped. Then a couple days later, he apologized. So then, I added another section. In post-production, I had punched in my initial thoughts about that whole spew and harshly and heavily critiqued Cole's sequence of actions and how much of a bad look it was on hip-hop. However, since I wasn't able to upload for a week, it gave me more time to digest the events that played out and how it correlates to my overarching point and message of this video. Over that week, my mindset has changed. Big puns at the best. You ain't a killer, you still learn how to walk. But J. Cole, you walked a path that was never designed for you or one you never truly wanted to be a part of because you a soft ass nigga. That can never not be said about him after witnessing this. However, I see this with tempered clarity now. You see, Earlier in the video, I said the attraction we both had and still, at this point, marginally, have to hip hop was based on its realness, its authenticity. Your words are like brushes and you paint images. J. Cole was one of the best at doing that and, excluding this battle rap culture he has now been exiled from, he still is one of the best at doing that. He is a storyteller, a kind and passionate person who seeks to uplift and teach others above all else whilst being an inspiring figure. However, in the recent years of him portraying himself to be this lyrical killer, he went on this seemingly four year long campaign about how he's the best but only he and pretty much no one else can stand up to him and sit on this platform that isn't Drake or Kendrick. And when looked back retrospectively, he's always been a self-conscious 
conscious rapper because neither Drake or Kendrick hardly, if ever, pushed the narrative that there was this big three. Drake, no matter what, never failed to let you know how many 26 year olds he had on lock and how he has an indoor court and just general top tier cornball groupie shit, but he never once allowed us to believe he wasn't the best. He always spit that in his raps. He always allowed himself to have that type of echelon and confidence that what he rapped is what he lived. Now, of course, none of us besides academics believed he was the best, but Drake always remained consistent. Kendrick never fucked with any competition in any light, and he honestly found disrespect in being compared to anyone in the rap game. He really had that fundamental mindset of, I am the best, no one's better than me, that's just what it is. He made this apparent both in interviews and his songs. J. Cole has been the only one to pussyfoot around, and because of that, and because of J. Cole assisting in creating this pussyfooting, tiptoeing, I am, I am not aura, not just around him, but hip hop in general, and because he's a storyteller, and because he is Jermaine, he cast this illusion that this big three was real, very much cool, and we all fell into it. Unbeknownst to us, he, along with us, created this new identity that the competitive sporting element of hip hop could be this shared space where it follows this seemingly Aristotelian idea of triads which dictates that the three is the denotation of life and without this triad system there is no rational function. The Aristotelians would believe that there is a below, middle, above, life, death, life after death. This conception helped identify and find solace in the unknown elements of the universe and funnily enough without knowing it to a capacity we did the exact same thing in hip hop. See, I've noticed with other genres, EDM, pop, country, J-pop, jazz, reggaeton, reggae, like essentially many, if not all other forms of music, you hardly see fights over this big three or who's really taking the top spot. You could argue and say it's because they're not as big as hip hop or competitive or it's different demographics, but you don't look at these genres competitively. We look at hip hop competitively, violently competitively might I add, and ironically, the genre which was birthed from oppression turned into the very two to combat each other. The language used, the themes of violence, the subject matter, it served to be the perfect instrument to channel rage, frustrations, disputes, fights, and beefs in a manner which we have never seen any other genre do, and the leaders of this are African Americans. Over the past week, my thoughts about J. Cole's decision has remained the same in regards to him, but as largely expanded in regards to the culture of hip hop. As far as J. Cole goes, everyone else has said it by now, but you're not a shooter. You spent all this time building up this character for a role you yourself cannot play or even want to play. You spent all this time sharpening your sword and when Kendrick came at the door, you want to turn to a pacifist. The mere fact you sounded unsure of yourself and just wrote a whole bunch of lies in that track was one thing, but then to go on stage and say how it badly affected you and how you didn't mean it is another thing, and then to play Love Yours right afterwards. See, now that's what triggered me. That's what triggered me. Him playing Love Yours after that is what triggered me, because understand this. J. Cole, you apologize for something you didn't do. Better yet, you apologize for something you didn't have to do. Imagine Nas apologizing for Ether. Imagine Jadakiss apologizing for Checkmate. Cube apologizing for no Vaseline. Imagine Muhammad Ali, the one you said you felt like, apologizing before and after talking shit. Imagine 50 Cent apologizing for literally anything. If you want to start something, finish it. But do you know what I can imagine? Jay-Z apologizing for Super Ugly. And you know what his team said at the time? That was a bad look. He gave the entire camp an L, so I guess the student really did become the master, huh? You fed into something the fans created and you didn't have to. This isn't like some Bleach, One Piece, Naruto, Big 3 where we as the fans made this up based on tangible figures. We just started saying, these three are the Big 3 because we want them to be. It's very alluring and we need a three-headed monster to spearhead this new generation of rap. And Cole was really and truly, out of the three of them, the only one to feed into it the most. So when you fail to act, of course, it's going to look bad on you. Now in the long run, J. Cole is still J. motherfucking Cole. We are still very much lucky to have someone like him who exists in this age who can really much truly exemplify rap, hip hop, and stand for something very strong. His music is fire. His EP was fire. What he stands for transcends rap and hip hop, but in doing so, he verified many pre-existing notions about hip hop being a shell of his former self fake and disingenuous. You should never engage in the battle your heart isn't in. 
I would have expected someone like J. Cole at his caliber to not even feed into the peer pressure and the noise the same way he did with No Name. Just act. Just rap. But under pressure, Cole does not exist. This isn't his domain. And in an already capitalistic driven market of hip hop, one of the foundations of it, the sport of competitiveness shaking on its last legs, what Cole did was so embarrassing it gave the entire culture an L. That's what he did. That's what this represents. It represents a man at the prime of his game, unable to realize the fact that he is J. Cole. He is good at what he does. He's a lyricist. He created this identity of a killer. However, he did not have the heart of a killer. And that's where he failed. And that's where he let us down. And that's where he let Nas down a second time. It's very reminiscent when Macklemore went on that very bitchy apologetic rant to Kendrick after he won album of the year. And Kendrick said he didn't even vibe out with that. The fans will think whatever they think, but you as an artist must stand in what you believe in and what you have. And what J. Cole showcased was not for the people that have a backbone, he showcased some very pussy footing ideology of, you know what, maybe the shit isn't for me. You're right, and now you've proved it. Don't do this ever again. Because you've just further scintillated the idea that no one can take each other seriously. No one can actively look at each other and just go down bar for bar go in a very strong competitive spirit and showcase what hip hop really is, a sport. It can be educational, it can be enlightening, but at the end of the day, we like seeing niggas go back and forth with it. That's why we like control, that's why we like the ciphers, that's why we like freestyles, that's why we like battle rap. Imagine seeing Geechee Gotti and Rum Nitty go back and forth in their face-offs and then when they battle, it's all huggy huggy, I don't really want to kill you. No, Rum Nitty battles every single nigga like he wants to kill that person. Tay Rock battles everybody like he wants to kill that person. Tay Rock versus Twerk, yeah they cool and they are on the same team and the same camp, but when you see these two battle each other, they are going at each other's necks. No one believed they hated each other, so why would J. Cole fall into that delusion? At this point in your career, you should acknowledge Kendrick Lamar is someone of admirable respect in the same culture as you, and why can you not just pick up the mantle and say, so am I? That's the biggest gripe with it. Which is why, like I said, you are a self-conscious, conscious rapper. And while I will always respect the music you have made, the strides you have made in the music industry and hip-hop and what you represent, I cannot respect the decision to say, I will hold my chin up and I'm going to let you punch me in my chin for something I didn't need to do, but it has affected me so much I'm going to expose myself in this light. There is an element of maturity in what Cole has done, but even if you want to look at PR stunts and execs and the business aspect of it that will overcomplicate things, how he removed 7 Minute Drill from the EP and then everything else surrounding this, I don't know if I can actually look at this decision as a culturally benefiting one. For Cole as an individual, he may have had his peace. And as fans, we have to respect that. However, as fans of a sport, as fans of the culture that was built upon the foundations of competitiveness and realness and authenticity, we can still look at this and not have that same level of affection towards this type of decision because deep down, there is an element of this we do not respect. So that is the area in which I draw the line. And that's the area in which I can see other people draw the line. Let's not forget, Cole is still one of the GOATs. However, in this climate in which he has exposed himself to be very malleable, he has removed himself and therefore he cannot be put into any more conversations of being a killer. When you think about literally any top tier caliber rapper, they've had to get in the ring at some point in their time. Nas and Jay-Z, Ja Rule and 50, Pac and Biggie, Eminem and Mariah Carey, some of the most legendary feuds in hip hop. And while Kendrick has been sending out shots, mostly implicitly, it's been hard to find feuds that have that same respectable battle competition to it unless you exclude Drake and Pusha T. Another one of them have really in the discussion to be in the top 10. Somehow, Everyone talks about banging straps, no diddy, but the straps are on safe mode. No one is a killer. No one has a veracity. No one is really competitive anymore. These are the conversations, those barbershop talks we don't have anymore because rappers have abandoned that in the pursuit of their monetary and social gains. I don't count drill rap as a competitive subgenre because that's just a bunch of rap snitches telling other business, sit in the court and be their own style witness whilst promoting the same violence hip hop at its roots reflected with the hopes of elevating past that. 
drill also being a phase in hip hop has now succumbed to such criticisms as to why someone could really shake the ground like Pop Smoke, even he would have lost his relevance if he, to great misfortune, wasn't murdered. Poor one out for the Wu, he was gone too soon. However, if maladaptive, people would have stopped asking for him. It happened with Chief Keef, Fabio Foran, Russ Millions, Tion Wayne, and pretty much all of UK drillers. Speaking of UK hip hop, it perfectly encapsulates that phase mentality. With 2018 2022 currently being its peak popularity years, it hit a hot spot with its ability to perfect drill music. Yes, I'm saying UK produced the best drill music, yes, better than Chicago, debatable with New York, y'all can fight with each other on that one, I don't care, suck your mother. But drill, for a time, being its flagship genre, only isolated the UK hip hop scene within those parameters, not knowing it wasn't going to grow past that. Of course, you have other rappers such as San San Dave, Stormzy, and Nux that stray away from such explicit and graphic themes that outlies in a mass acknowledgement of the hip hop scene in the West. As far as Western convention goes, we have remained in a space where it is harder and harder to take this genre more seriously as before. I think what bothers me so much about the state of hip hop right now is the fact that it failed to evolve into something which executes strong elements of balance. A form which was able to grow past its humble and rough upbringing and present itself as a form in which others could be inspired, humbled, motivated, and excited by. Instead, it's created a cauldron of redundancy and repetitiveness whilst constantly reliving its glory days. It's allowed itself to be buffed by one form of art which also came from oppression, that being jazz, only to be not only moderated and controlled by those same constructs of oppression, but to have its patrons constantly reform and dismantle the authenticity of its very philosophy in favor of one which endorses more capitalistic and hedonistic lifestyles. It reached a point of freedom, but had no idea how to understand itself in its new state, and thus looked towards another system to lead and direct it, something which it should never do. While you have its champions residing in the kingdoms in which they try to hold on to the previous prestige which contributed heavily to African American culture and led the world, it was quick to abandon its leaders of truth and revolution for power, money, and faux status. I think hip hop is, in truth, the representation of western black culture, a power so unique, complex, diverse, influential, and intelligent, but it's being led by ill-suited individuals that serve as demagogues as opposed to enlightened kings, as readers feel like a case where we're being led by the wrong people. However, call it hopeless idealism, I still find so much love passion and drive in this art form. Straying from the path does not mean we've abandoned who we are, it just means we need to understand what inspired such a movement in the first place. This isn't to say we must revert back to that feeling of helplessness, but instead truly capture the power of liberation led by wisdom, assisted by that vibrance of fun and ecstasy. Its subgenres and multiple forms isn't something that can be or should be contained, but if seen and handled differently, its power can return back into the hands it was made from. This isn't something you can put a price tag on because the soul and spirit of it comes from the same people that bled and died to free themselves from those very price tags. At its core, cool, when all is stripped away, this is the language of the unheard. This is the spirit of the unrattled. This is the strength of the collectively creative. This is the legacy of kings and queens. This is freedom. This is hip hop. This is us. And no matter the ambitions that try to reign supremacy over it, this is a form that was birthed out of the audacity and passion of those that wanted to fight for something a lot greater than them. And because of that, this can never die. Devil, lay down, devil, lay down, dish that level, make devils play now. Hold up, no peace, hold up, police, no call, police, just stay pokies, pray for new life, pray for new breath. Hey Lord, make, make sure you no. stay for who's left. No, you can't find a place to rest. Know the Lord, my bullet, who best when we survive. The know that the we best. Never be able to stop us ever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, what a week. <laughs> First and foremost, yo, before I say anything. I don't know if you're watching this, but to the person that sent me fan mail the other week to my email, thank you for that. Like, seriously, dead ass. Like, that was very thoughtful. I find so much appreciation in those sentimental efforts, and they're so thoughtful, and they showcase so much effort to go out of your way to just show support. So, you know who you are if you're still listening. You, yes, you. Like, I shout out to you. I got so much love for you. Thank you for that. Like, 
I kept that shit for real, and I'm gonna keep that shit. So, once again, thank you. To so everyone else, thank you all for making it in the video. This was a motherfucking yapathon, but you know, I love this shit. I wouldn't do it if 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 I didn't love it. I wouldn't dedicate 30 plus hours of Edison if I didn't want to talk to y'all. <laughs> oh, that was so long. <laughs> I'm so glad this is done. <laughs> well, it was crazy, but you know, you know, this is something I've been wanting to talk about for a cool minute now because, ironically. Uh, I want to say about a year and a half ago, I made three videos on my TikTok talking about how old hip hop is better than new hip hop. And to summarize those videos, I was kind of talking about how if things cannot change, it won't get better or if it won't adapt to the times. And I was talking about how it was predominantly better just from a commercial sense and it was a lot more lucrative and profitable. And it was able to find new avenues and errors into the market. But, uh, a year and a half, you know, a year and a half later, I'm like, eh, you know, maybe if we went back a little bit, it would, that wouldn't be too bad either. <laughs> maybe we've kind of lost it a little bit, but that's all right. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, needless to say, this is something that, once again, you cannot control. Like, you can't really contain this. No matter who you are, you cannot control the state or flow of hip-hop. And in those videos, I even said, you know, y'all may say if Pac and Biggie were still alive, then this wouldn't have happened, but Rakim's still alive. Jay Z still alive, Nas is still alive, Wu Tang, the, the, uh, the majority of Wu Tang is still alive, uh, Lauren Hill is still alive. All these great artists are still alive, and none of them really changed Six Nine from coming, did they? You know what I mean? So it, it doesn't matter who's here and who's not here. You're not gonna stop what the fuck this, this is gonna turn into. Of course, we can dictate that market, but at the end of the day, this is a business, and they want to go to where the money's at. The all we gotta do is make sure that the you know that the money does not. Uh, create conformity to where this has become a very unidentified object. Uh, <laughs> Goddamn. Um, essentially, but that's what hip hop is. It, you, know, it's it's a lifestyle. It's that audacity to say fuck that, fuck you, and I'm gonna do what the fuck I want to do. And I feel like this kind of lost a little bit. So we got to skip back to our roots about why the fuck this shit is so special. Why the fuck this shit has persisted throughout the ages. Uh, but by just by cosmic irony. That week where I wasn't able to upload, motherfucker, the whole world just went to shit. <laughs> Fucking Drake, not Drake, well, Drake, well, I mean, Drake too, but J. Cole dropped his diss track, then he apologized for it, then he took it down, then Drake dropped his diss track, then Rick Ross dropped his diss track, then DJ Academics was dick slurping Drake, and then Joe Bun's going crazy, and Iran is going on fucking fire, and everything just happened all at the same time, and I'm down here in Mookin in Central 46, like, let me out, I want to talk about this. Uh, I suppose this is a great time to quickly give you my thoughts on the whole Drake thing, because I'm, uh, recording this on the 14th of April, so, quick thoughts on a Drake this, I mean, it was alright, it was cool, uh, you know, it, it, it sounded like old Drake, uh, a little bit sound like Drizzy, but, and I'm a, and I'm not even trying to sound like a Drake hater, even though, you know, it may come across the way I'm not a Drake hater, uh, I, I still find value, and I still like his, I was, you know, some of his music, uh, a lot of his old stuff, but, you know, his drama was pretty cool, you know what I mean, it was just like, you know, oh, can't you, you know, you, you know, you're five foot nothing, and, Without me, y'all niggas wouldn't exist. And in, in truth, the same way Drake said, without me, y'all wouldn't exist, uh, the artists could say the same thing about Drake. Like, without them, Drake wouldn't exist because we all know Drake is a motherfucking groupy ass nigga that'll hop on to the next big artist for a feature and then he'll do whatever he wants. And then, you know, some of his recent hits comes from features of other people. So, Drake, let's keep it a stack fifth. You leech off of them as much as they leech off of you. So, nah, you know, I don't know. Uh, but like, that's like a very quick tidbit on what I think about that one. Rick Ross, uh, nah, I don't really care. He said he, he called Drake white like eight, like 80 times. And I'm like, come on, Rick. Like, like oh, uh, uh, white boy. And, uh, nigga, what? <laughs> nigga, do better. Um, that's the thing about that. And I don't know, like, there's so much more I could talk about with the subject. So will that, you know, will that be a part two, part three? Who knows? Maybe, probably in a future, nowhere near soon, because that would be a longer video. And I'm gonna, be, I, I'm gonna keep it a whole buck fifth. I don't have the time to be editing like one video for out so much time. Cause I got, I got other shit to do and I'm not shit to talk about. As much as I love it, I just don't have that type of time and resources to do that consistently. Uh, I will one day though, you know what I mean? Those days are coming. But I'm rambling now, so I'm about to shut the fuck up. Oh, lastly, that Redux reference, y'all killed that shit. I didn't expect I didn't expect a lot of y'all to really fucking do that. I'm gonna be so real. I'm gonna keep it a buck. <laughs> y'all are on the kingdom for that one for real. I love that shit. So let's do that again. <laughs> so for the next video, um, in the comments, 
comment your favorite fruit and why don't say nothing like don't explain that to nobody let's put in your favorite fruit and go about your day my favorite fruit apples specifically a red gala apple if you don't like red gala apples fire for that i, I don't rate y'all like y'all can go all the way away from me like red gala apples or no apples i'm gonna fuck fuck them green apples i mean red gala gang real shit <laughs> but yeah go there for the next video and you know i exciting stuff is unfolding most definitely i got some big stuff lined up planned up i mean booked busy booked busy and plotting i think that's how it goes i think that's what y'all said uh booked and busy and i got some great content stored up as well and i'm just uh, i'm excited to go ahead and show it with y'all anyway y'all stay safe these are very troubling times and scary times so make sure y'all hit up your homeboys and your homegirls and your significant others and just make sure you tell them that you love them and shit you know what i mean these are crazy times we're living in and at the end of the day you're all, you know i mean you're all just trying to make it out of here and try and do good uh this is not a therapy session Redux, shut the fuck up all right <laughs> until next time thank y'all for listening to the video and yeah, that's it, shouts I go. Peace.